to the first observatory night of 2016. We're coming to you from the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And tonight's topic, asteroids. Especially the ones that come a little too close for comfort. Now, to start, I have a question. Before tonight, how many of you knew that the clearinghouse for all worldwide observations of asteroids and comets is located right here at the Center for Astrophysics. An impressive number. <laughs> well, for those of you who didn't know, it is. It's called the Minor Planet Center, and uh, Minor Planet is basically a historical name for asteroid. And I believe that the staff of the Minor Planet Center are some of the unsung heroes of astronomy. They do a difficult job on a shoestring budget, and they have to be available 20, someone has to be available 24 seven, just in case something a little worrying comes our way. <clears throat> so, tonight's speaker, Jose Luis Galache, is the acting deputy director of the Minor Planet Center. He joined the Center for Astrophysics as a postdoc in 2006 after getting his PhD in astronomy from the University of Southampton in the UK. And he has been working at the Minor Planet Center since 2010, so he can give us all the insights we could possibly want about its inner workings. And with that, I'll turn it over to tonight's speaker. of the year and thank you very much for braving the cold and coming out to learn about asteroids. So first of all a public service announcement. You probably all are aware that we love our acronyms and we're told that we shouldn't use them in public talks but I'm not going to get away from not using NEA and NEO. So an NEA is a near-earth asteroid and an NEO is a near-earth object and confusingly, we sometimes use them interchangeably, even though a near-Earth object can be a comet, which technically isn't an asteroid. But just try not to pay too much attention to that. If I say NEA or NEO, I'm talking about a near-Earth something. <laughs> so the title is The Fear and Fun in Asteroids. And I'll start with fear. By the way, we should have scheduled this for Halloween, shouldn't we? <laughs> so, Let's start by seeing an asteroid up close, which most people don't get to do in their lifetime. Now, you probably are aware of this. In, on uh, February 15, 2013, over Russia, this thing popped up. And we all know about it because Russians love their dash cams. And there are hundreds, literally hundreds, of dash cam videos of this object streaking across the sky. And I hope you saw how the shadows moved, like a sundial, in that image over there. And I like these two. This is very interesting. Here you can see the object over there coming out and moving towards the left. And in this video, it's moving towards the right, because these two drivers are driving towards each other, and the asteroid is coming between them. Now, technically, it's a meteor here, because it's in the atmosphere. And eventually it became a meteorite because some pieces did actually hit the ground. But uh, the scary part was the shock wave. So here are some damaged uh, windows, and this is a roof that actually collapsed from the, the shock wave. And this is the first lesson of the night. If you see a really bright ball of light, especially in the daylight sky, <laughs> you, you know, see it through the window and be like, oh, wow, that's cool, but then turn around and get into an inside room or under a desk or something because a few minutes later the shockwave is going to arrive and in this case the shockwave arrived I think a minute and a half later more or less because this asteroid exploded at 27 kilometers above the ground and the people that were injured over a thousand were not actually injured by the asteroid but by flying bits of glass although there were some people who were outside and who were looking at the, the meteor burning up and they got sunburn from the UV radiation. So if you're inside, move away from the windows. If you're outside, probably go like this. <laughs> uh, but try to film it if you can. <laughs> Don't sue me if you get hurt. 
So bad things can happen when an asteroid gets too close to Earth, and uh, in Russia again, because they're unlucky. Um, it's not that they're unlucky, but look at it, this, Russia. It's huge, so chances are that if it's going to hit land, it might hit Russia more often than it hits um, Monaco, for example. <laughs> so in 1908, on a very nice summer's day in June, something came over the skies much brighter than what you just saw in those videos. And it was seen from a few hundred miles away, even. And it exploded, uh, not at 27 kilometers, but at more like three to five kilometers, which is like one to three miles, more or less. Uh, and at that height, obviously, the, the shockwave was much, much more powerful. And you can see this photo on the left, which was taken, I think, 20 years later uh, at the site. And you can see all those downed trees. And this is the area. It's shaped like a, uh, like a butterfly wing, which back in the day, in the early 20th century, it seemed a little bit strange. But today, simulations of explosions and actually nuclear explosions that have been observed, when you have something that's moving very fast and explodes in the air, this is the shape that it produces, uh, which actually is one of the reasons why we think that it was actually an asteroid and not something else. And that's quite a large area. Um, basically, if, if that hit, if the epicenter were Boston, you would be reaching Quincy, um, if you go out west, you don't make it to Worcester, but pretty close. So that's, that's the area that uh, the trees were felled. And people who were um, two or three hundred miles away actually got hit by the air blast, and some windows were broken that far away. Luckily, this is a very remote area, so as far as we know, nobody died, although there were probably elk that weren't that lucky. 50,000 years ago, something else came into our atmosphere. And this time it didn't explode over the, the ground, it made it to the ground. And that's because the previous asteroid was made out of stone, while this asteroid was made out of metal. So while it fused due to the intense heat as it goes through the atmosphere, the, the pressure that builds up in front of the asteroid coming in, which was enough to blow up the stony asteroid, was not enough to break apart this metal asteroid. And if you ever get a chance to go here, I certainly advise you to do that. It's, it's breathtaking, it's amazing. Uh, when you're on the ground, you just can't believe how big this thing is. So it's three quarters of a mile, and I can't remember how deep it is, but I calculated that if you put the Prudential Center in the center of the building, you'd see about 15 floors poking up over the top. So that's how deep it is. And in fact, you get a little bit of microclimate down in the bottom. So it can be really fairly warm outside and it'll still be cold in the bottom. It takes about an hour to walk around. And even today, uh, they're, they're still picking up pieces of the asteroid, which dis basically disintegrated on impact. And even as a, a few miles away, they still find pieces. And this is private land, so you're not allowed to go and find it. Um, but you can go and buy some of these pieces in the souvenir shop, of course. And 65 million years ago, um, this was even worse. So for those of you who can't see the, the line down there, it says, well, there's something you don't see every day. And it's probably a good thing too, right? Because uh, it didn't turn out so well for the poor dinosaurs. Um, as you all know, an asteroid hit. Uh, there's some debate whether it was a comet or an asteroid. And we're finding out now that comets are very close cousins to asteroids. And very often we actually see asteroids that have been asteroids for decades and all of a sudden they develop a tail or a coma. And we see comets that we think are dead and when you look at them, they actually look like asteroids. So there are some differences certainly, but they're not, it's not like asteroid and comet. It's more like yeah, asteroid and comet. Uh, but the evidence seems tilted towards it, this being an asteroid. Not that, you know, the dinosaurs would be discussing like, oh, I think it's an asteroid, I think it's a comet. <laughs> It hit, and 70% um, of life on Earth was destroyed, which is a sobering thought. So I'm not going to throw numbers at you. I'm just going to throw pictures. That is the size of the fireball. And yes, that is North America up there, Latin America down here. That's the Gulf of Mexico, and it 
hit right off the Yucatan Peninsula there. So that was the size of the fireball. Obviously anything that was in that area was fried. And this is the air blast and the ejector. So you can see two circles more or less. There's a bit of shading, so that's the inner circle, that's the outer circle. So the air blast made it all the way up to the, the Great Lakes. So if you were in the Great Lakes, not that there were any humans there, but you would have probably been knocked over by the air blast, which is it's amazing. And the ejector just went halfway around the world because it went up into the, the stratosphere, got caught in currents, and then made it all the way down again. And of course, you have something hitting in water, and that's going to cause a tsunami. So there you go. That's the tsunami, and it just about made it there to Hawaii. I'm not sure that Hawaii was actually there back in the day, because the continents did look different, but again, a sobering thought. And this is the crater. So this is modern day uh, United States. This is the Yucatan Peninsula, and this is the actual size of the crater. And over there we have an, an image. It's a, a gravity map of the area because the crater is actually below many, many hundreds of meters of sediment. And it's 170 kilometers wide. And that was caused by an asteroid about 10 kilometers or six miles in size. And funnily enough, this image was made by these two gentlemen who were working for Pemex, which is the Mexican, the state Mexican oil company. So they were probably looking for oil and they found this. And it was suspected that there must be a crater uh, left over from when the dinosaurs disappeared and it hadn't been located and this is how it was found. And it matches the age and everything else, so it makes sense that, that this is it. Is it the only crater? Well, I've shown you two craters so far. Uh, there are many more. 188 right now, um, <coughs> confirmed craters. And there are maybe a couple dozen more that may or may not be that haven't been confirmed. And this is kept by the Planetary and Space Science Center in Canada, which is sort of the minor planet center for impact craters. And what's interesting here is that you see quite a few in, in the US. Um, not that many in Africa, quite a few in Scandinavia, and very few in Russia. And I just told you that, you know, most likely they're going to hit Russia, right? But a lot of this area is um, bereft of people. So if there aren't people to stumble across a circular formation and say, oh, this looks interesting, let me contact some geologists and see what they think, you might not find uh, the crater. And the, the United States Geological Survey does a lot of work, and, and that's probably one of the reasons that we get so many craters, known craters, in the US. And then we have Australia, which has a whole bunch of them. Now Australia is, um, has a, a lot of desert or, or arid landscape, and as you might imagine, it's a lot easier to spot a crater in a desert than it is if it's covered in vegetation. So that's one of the main difficulties in finding craters of vegetation which might explain why the Amazon doesn't have any known craters in there. And I did an extrapolation, assuming the, the number of craters that we've found in Australia and extrapolating to the amount of land elsewhere in the world, that there should be some 520 craters. And we've only found 188. So there are, there are quite a few to be found. And of course, we have the craters that hit the sea. 70% of the globe is covered in water, so 70% of the impacts should have hit the sea. Uh, but those, it's more difficult for they, them to create a crater because they have to go through the water. They'll produce a tsunami. But there are some craters that um, are underneath. I believe that one is below the surface. Then, of course, you have the Yucatan one that's partially below. You can see one up there off the coast of Norway. Um, but they you get less craters and they also um, get blurred out by erosion. So, a lot of craters and what does that mean and what can we learn from it? And I promise that this is the most complicated graph I'm going to put up <laughs> all night. 
I didn't make it. I apologize on behalf of Al Harris. Uh, and funnily enough, side story, there are two Al Harrises in the asteroid field. One is in the US and one is in Germany, although he's British. And they both have the same middle name. <laughs> so it, it's really difficult when you're reading a paper to know who is who. And just to mess with people, they actually wrote a paper, the two of them together, <laughs> which is Harris and Harris. And we don't know which one is which. So the, the American one we call Al Harris the Elder, which he's not too happy about, but you know. <laughs> he was born the first. So let me try to clarify this a little bit. OK, so the arrows indicate the direction of where things increase. So towards here, we have larger asteroids. Going up here, we have more asteroids. Going down, we have impacts that are spaced longer in time. And up there, the impact energy increases to the right. So what I want you to look at here are these blue circles. So see how it goes up, then there's a little wave, and then it keeps going up. So these are the expected number of asteroids that we have for each size. And the thing you have to take into account is that these numbers here are not absolute numbers, they're cumulative numbers, which means, for example, that if we look at 0 0.01 kilometers, so that's 10 meters, and we follow that up, and then across, that's about 10 to the 8, so that's 100 million. So that means there are 100 million near-Earth asteroids larger than 10 meters. So that's 10, 11, 12, 20, 100 meters, 1 kilometer, all the way up to the largest, which is 50 kilometers. Um, so how do we come across, or how do we come about this, this curve? How do we guess that? I always get that question. It's like, well, how do you know how many there are if, if you haven't counted them all? Because we haven't. And it's a little bit like tagging wildlife. So if you imagine you're counting, I don't know, let's imagine wolves. And you, an expedition goes out to where the wolves hang out. You trap a wolf. You put one of those annoying things on their ears. You write it down. Uh, you trap another one. Expedition goes home. I don't know, it's found seven wolves. Next month, they go out again. They get however many wolves they get. And they find that some of them were already tagged. So they're like, OK, we already tagged these two. And they find six new ones. So when you keep doing that, at some point, you're going to find that you get seven wolves, and they're all tagged. And then you come back next month, and you get 10 wolves, and they're all tagged. And you come back next month, and you get another eight wolves, and they're all tagged. And at that point, you're like, well, maybe we've found them all. But until you reach that point, you, find you get some that are tagged and some that are not. And that ratio of how many you find tagged versus the ones that are new is going to tell you something about the population as a whole. So when people observe asteroids, they send the Minor Planet Center those observations. We figure out if they're known asteroids or unknown. We put them in our database. So what Al Harris did was go back through the years and look at the surveys and see how many asteroids they were observing that were already known. And as time goes by, you re-observe the same asteroid more often, and you find fewer and fewer new asteroids. And looking at how those numbers vary with respect to each other, you can say something about the underlying population. So once we have this population, and by the way, red curve as well. So the red curve are the asteroids we know about. And you can see that it goes up and it follows the blue dots here, and then it goes off down there. So this tells us that we're, we've actually discovered most or all of these asteroids up to about this size, which is about a kilometer. So up to a kilometer, we've mostly discovered all of them, which is good, because a kilometer is expected to be the size at which, if we were impacted by one, we would have uh, global consequences. So a smaller asteroid, it can ruin your day or ruin your county, but at least it's not going to be global. And that's what we want. Okay? We don't want to be the next dinosaurs. So some interesting numbers here. Chelyabinsk, that was the, the asteroid in Russia. So it was about 17 meters. And if we go up there, we look to the left, we see that there are about, let me see, 10 to the 7, almost 10 to the 7, so almost. 9 times 10 to the 6, that's 9 million. Almost 9 million of them. Yeah, 9 million, that's a big number, right? 
Yeah, yeah, that's a big number. Uh, how many have we found? Mm, about 10,000. <laughs> have a way to go. <laughs> if we come to the other side, oh, those are really close together, so that's uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So we expect an impact every 50 or 60 years from an asteroid that size. Um, we've been keeping, well, the US Air Force has been keeping count, not of asteroid impacts, but of nuclear explosions that happen in the atmosphere. But they get a lot more uh, asteroids coming in and exploding as meteors than they do get nuclear explosions. And they haven't detected any, I think, in the last 20 years that they've been, uh, that's how long they've been tracking. So the, the Chelyabinsk one was the biggest one in the last 20 years. Then we have Tunguska. Um, that big butterfly piece of destruction. So that was about 40 meters or so. And here we see that they, we have um, almost, almost 10 million, I mean, almost a million. Um, and these impact about once every 200 years. So we got one in 1908. Does that mean that we're gonna get one a century from now? It actually doesn't, because these numbers are just averages. So you, it's an average calculated over a very long time, uh, but unfortunately we can't actually tell you when the next asteroid impact is going to happen unless we've discovered the asteroid that's going to hit us, and we know about it. If not, we can't calculate it. It's a random event. So if you count how many impacts over 100 million years, yes, on average, something like Tunguska happens every two centuries or so, on average. But it could happen in 1908 and then happen in 1909 again, and then not happen for 600 years, and then you get another three in a row. We don't know. Maybe more importantly, this one down here, Chicxulub. That's the dinosaur killer. And there are about a thousand of them. And, no, sorry, not a thousand of them. So it says, Two. <laughs> so this is the issue. This uh, it's a uh, it's an approximation. There are, I think, three or four that are larger than that size, and they imp impact every two hundred uh, million years or so. Um, dinosaurs were sixty-five million years ago, so you know, odds are good that we're not going to get another one, right, for a while. Um, but the odds are actually better than that because we have found most of the asteroids. All of the asteroids, actually, that are larger than 10 kilometers, and most of the asteroids, over, well over 90%, that are larger than one kilometer. So we're good on that front. Humanity will persist. So after that little piece of good news, let's go to the fun of asteroids. So first of all, about time I explain what an asteroid is, right? This is the, the solar nebula. So this is the... This is our neighborhood about 4.5 billion years ago. You have the sun, you have protoplanets, which are not quite formed into full planets, and you have here the, the asteroid belt between proto-Mars and proto-Jupiter. You can see a, a lot of dust there, and bits and pieces here, and less dust and less bits and pieces out here. And this dashed line is the snow line. So this is where we expect that from here onwards, you can get liquid water, and from here outwards, you get frozen water. Hence these little comet-like objects. And what happened here in the asteroid belt is that a planet was trying to form, but Jupiter, which is the gravitational bully of the solar system, kept perturbing all this material, so it couldn't actually coalesce into a, a giant planet, or a big planet. And instead, what happened is that we got asteroid series, which is now being visited by the Dawn spacecraft, which is about a thousand kilometers in size, and that's the biggest object in the asteroid belt, and it's a dwarf planet. And then a whole load of smaller, Vesta's the second largest, and a lot of smaller um, objects. And despite the many millions of objects that are in the, the asteroid belt, if you put all their masses together, they'd be about a third of the moon's mass. So there's not a lot of stuff there. And what continues to happen to this day, 
because Jupiter hasn't stopped being a gravitational bully, is that it perturbs the asteroid belt. So asteroids are going around, doing their thing, but if an asteroid, for example, encounters Jupiter at this point, um, say, for every once that Jupiter goes around the Sun, this asteroid goes around twice, it's going to find Jupiter at the same point once every two times that it has an orbit. And after millions of years, Jupiter will pull it and um, will change its orbit. And what that does, and what has been happening over millions of years, <coughs> is that asteroids get either kicked out of the solar system or they actually get pushed into the inner solar system. And when they go into the inner solar system, they can pass via Mars, Venus, and of course Earth. And these are the near-Earth asteroids. And that is how we get near-Earth asteroids. They weren't, most of them anyway, weren't <coughs> formed near Earth. They were formed in the asteroid belt. And Jupiter and Saturn as well plays a small role through them at us. And, and it's a steady state. So we don't have the same near-Earth asteroids that we had 100 million years ago. They live in our neighborhood for maybe 10 million years. And then they either fall into the sun or they get flung out because they also have encounters with Earth, or with Venus, or, or with Mars, and that changes their orbit as well. So we have different types of asteroids, and we know that because we have different types of meteorites, which are just asteroids that were tired of flying around and came down to Earth. So we have a protoplanet, and this planet was large enough that it differentiated, just like the Earth, which means that all the metal bits that it had accumulated went and sunk to the center. And the core was probably molten at some point. It was a big ball of iron and nickel. And then around it, there was a semi-molten <coughs> mantle of silicates, which are just rocks, and then a crust, a harder crust on the outside. And there were many more asteroids a few billion years ago in the asteroid belt. There were a lot of collisions. So a lot of these protoplanets, they were go along forming, and then bam, they smash into another one, they break up, and what do we have? Well, we have bits of the core, which are iron asteroids, and then we have bits of the mantle, which produce um, the, the silicate asteroids, or the stony asteroids. And then there's another type of um, asteroid and meteorite, which are called the, the chondrites, which never actually formed into a planet. They, didn't, they weren't attracted into the planet. They were just bits of dust that gathered together. And these are fossils left over from the formation of the solar system because they were never heated as all that material was heated. And they weren't mixed. So when you get one of these, the composition is the same as a solar nebula 4.5 billion years ago, which I think is fantastic. And I've, I've held some, but I've never actually seen one cut open, but I've been told by people who have that when you cut them open, you get the smell of tar because of all the organic compounds that they have, which not they don't have life. What I mean by organic compounds is um, compound molecules that contain carbon. And these are the building blocks of, of us, of life. So these raining down upon the Earth, as they have done for billions of years, these could be the, the building blocks that eventually became us and that started life going. So more asteroids. We have actually sort of visited or flown by quite a few of them. And these are to scale. Emily Lakhdawala um, made this um, for the Planetary Society. And we've visited a few more since then. But I quite like this one because the others are a bit larger. So I, I like to be able to see this. Here are some comets. Um, we have Eros, which was the very first near-Earth asteroid discovered in 1898, back then. And we have little Takawa. I don't know if you guys can see that little dot there, a few pixels, which is another near-Earth asteroid. And the others are main belt asteroids. And if you see up there, Dactyl, the one by the sea in the credit, that is actually not an asteroid, it's a moon. It's the moon of Ida the big asteroid next to it. And that was the first moon of an asteroid ever discovered. And until then, it had been hypothesized that maybe asteroids had moons, but 
Um, it was thought that if they were regular in shape, maybe uh, they wouldn't be able to, to maintain them or they wouldn't be stable. But since then, a lot more asteroid moons have been found. And in fact, one out of six asteroids appears to have a moon. So see that, that little thing? It's a kawa. So from out here, these look really smooth, right? Because a lot of these photos have been taken from thousands of miles away as a spacecraft was flying by. And you can see craters here showing that, indeed, it was bombarded. Uh, Lutetia was bombarded in the main belt by, by lots of asteroids over a long time. And some of the, what's interesting here is some of the features, like, for example, right there, that crater is, is really soft and, and smoothed out, right? But then you have, like, these here that are really sharp. So that indicates, first, that some of these craters are older than others, and second, that there's something going on on the asteroid that smoothes out the craters. Now, if it were a solid piece of rock, mm, well, what would smooth out a solid piece of rock in space? So this is Itokawa up close. And, and here you can see it's covered in little boulders. And you can see sand, right? So, of course, being astronomers, we can't call it sand. We call it regolith. You know, it sounds a lot more important, and it looks better when you're putting in a proposal. You're not studying, studying sand, studying regolith. And there are people who study regolith. And it's very important because it has thermal properties. If you have more regolith, uh, the asteroid is going to heat up differently than if there's no regolith at all. But what we're finding is that this is what asteroids and comets actually look like. They have boulders hanging on for dear life because gravity is very small here, very low, and you have a lot of regolith. And there's a process called gardening whereby this material gets reprocessed. Like when you, you turn over the, the earth after every year before you, you plant something to renew the earth and oxygenate it. So it's the same process. And that's what's making, well, one of the processes that's making those large craters, old craters, smooth over. So let me put some text up, just one time. So why do we want to study asteroids? Like I said, they offer pristine samples of the solar nebula. Um, I'm not sure what example I can give, but we can, we can peer 4.5 billion years ago from a laboratory by studying a meteorite that was formed from the solar nebula and that was never heated, never touched, just locked up. And you cut it open and you're like, you're opening up a slice of 4.5 billion years ago. And the slices are different. So it turns out that the solar nebula wasn't uniform and it had a different composition closer into the sun than further out. And even in the asteroid belt, which is, which is quite extensive, um, you find that the asteroids that formed on the inside are quite different from the asteroids that formed on the outside. The further away you go from the sun in the asteroid belt, the darker the asteroids get. And there I got a two for one. So clues to the dynamical history of the solar system. The solar system wasn't formed as it is today. It's thought that the giant planets formed further out and that they migrated inwards and that maybe Jupiter, there's a jump in Jupiter theory that says that Saturn actually formed inside and then Jupiter <coughs> jumped over Saturn and, and went inside. And, and when you design these models, these computer models, you can make them reproduce what the planets look like today, which is good. But if they don't reproduce what the asteroids look like today, what the populations look like, the, the asteroid belt, then that model is wrong. And you don't know that unless you have the asteroids. And also the impact history of the solar system. Look, look at a, our moon, for example. It's, it's full of uh, um, craters because it doesn't have an atmosphere to protect it. But some areas don't have craters or have fewer than other areas. And that's because there was uh, tectonic activity, volcanic activity, and the Maria, for example, we now know are not seas. That's what Maria means in, in Latin, because they used to think it, they were seas. Now we know that it's lava, solidified lava. 
So there's been activity on the moon, and we know that because some areas have craters and others don't, and we can also tell when this activity happened because of the number of craters, because we can expect a flux of asteroids to hit the moon, and we know how many craters we should be finding per square kilometer, say. So if we find many less or a bit less, we can um, construct the ages of those different areas. And like I said, the uh, many asteroids, the, the carbonaceous ones, especially they, they, um, they contain organic compounds, and that's what we are made of, uh, the, the building blocks of amino acids. So did, did we have them on Earth, or was Earth too hot because it was at one point molten? And did we get them from the asteroids? And, of course, self-preservation, because we do not want to go the way of the, the dinosaurs. And I, I like this very much, uh, even though I'm talking about near-Earth asteroids, I'm going to show the whole solar system. And thank you, NASA, for making it so accurate. The one thing I have to point out is that it is to scale, but it's not linear scale. It's logarithmic. So the distance from the Sun to Earth is one, which is what we call uh, astronomical units, or AU. I'll say astronomical units because I promise not to use any acronyms, apart from any A's. So Saturn is 10 times further from the Sun than the Earth, so 10 astronomical units, um, even though here it appears to be the same distance, just because it's logarithmic. So this is uh, one astronomical unit, 10 times further, 100 times further. And this is very easy to remember. 100 times, 100 astronomical units is where the, the solar system ends. And what I like about this uh, map of the solar system, because most artists leave these things out, is that there are asteroids. All these dots here, all these dots here, those are asteroids, because asteroids are everywhere in the solar system. Most of them are in the asteroid belt, but you have near-Earth asteroids. You have asteroids in the same orbit as Jupiter, the Trojan asteroids, which lead in front and behind. You have the, the Kuiper belt out here, and then you have this, the Oort cloud, which as you can see is not flat, it's actually a sphere. And Jan Oort hypothesized that if we are getting um, long period comets that appear seemingly out of nowhere and they come from anywhere in the sky and go around the sun and then whiz off and we never see them again, then there has to be a reservoir of these objects. And if they're coming from everywhere in the sky, then this reservoir must be a shell. And that is the Oort cloud, which hasn't been directly observed, but we expect that it does exist. Okay, so let's find the NEOs. <laughs> Challenge number one. So you take a, a photo, and okay, so can anybody spot the asteroids? <laughs> I don't even know where they are. So what we need to do is actually take more than one photograph so that you can spot the asteroids move because they move against the stellar background. Not the only problem. So to exemplify this problem, I'm gonna play a little clip of Armageddon because Many people don't know that there's an unspoken rule that if you give a talk about asteroids, you have to have a clip from Armageddon. <laughs> and going back to what Christine was saying about the movies, most people get their knowledge of asteroids from Armageddon. <laughs> and Armageddon is a really entertaining movie. It was a lot of fun. And I think it got nothing right about asteroids. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want me to present this movie, yeah, I will. <laughs> I need to be allowed to use foul language, though. <laughs> now, this clip actually plays the one, one scientifically accurate thing that is in this movie, okay? It's a 10-second clip. So, I think the movie's two hours long. <laughs> and it brings us challenge number two of finding near-Earth asteroids. Let's hope this plays. And it doesn't play. Oops. It played when we tested it. Well, the volume is up there. That volume is up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, folks. Okay, the media is on. 
on, so try it again. I'm, I'm trying to rewind it. Let's see. Uh, Are you there, Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Yeah, everything's plugged in. Plug it out, plug it in. No. It was going to be so good. <laughs> yes, I can't tell you exactly where it is, <laughs> what point in the movie, um, but let me replay it. Uh, what's happening here is that an asteroid has been discovered. By the way, who has seen Armageddon? Can I get a raise of hand? Yeah, quite a lot of people. It's from 98, so it's, a, it's been a while. You may not remember. The, the asteroid, a large asteroid, has been discovered, and of course everybody is in a panic. And the president is somewhere, I don't know where he is, and he's having a teleconference with the NASA administrator. And the NASA administrator is played by Billy Bob Thornton. And the president is asking what's on everybody's mind, obviously. Why didn't NASA spot it? Because whenever these things happen, it's always like, why didn't NASA see it? As if that's NASA's only job, right? <laughs> and Billy Bob Thornton says, and I paraphrase a little bit, he says, uh, well, sir, we have a budget of one million a year to look for asteroids, and that lets us cover 3% of the sky. And begging your pardon, sir, it's a big ass guy. <laughs> that is the one scientifically correct <laughs> statement in this movie. And I'm happy to say that now we d cover more than 3%. We cover the whole Northern Hemisphere sky every month, which is a bit better. And back then in 98, the budget wasn't a million dollars. They wish it was. Um, Right now, it's actually gone up to $50 million. So uh, if you're wondering, it's 8 p.m., where are your tax dollars? They, a small portion of them are, are looking for near-Earth asteroids. Okay, so challenge number three. You know, going back to the Jabinsk bolide. So see how it whizzes really fast when it goes around here and then it slows down? That's because it's on an elliptical orbit. And as Kepler taught us, when they're far away from the sun, objects on an elliptical orbit are going to move a lot slower than when they are closer to the sun. And here it's coming around, and here's the Earth, and then bump. And in case my hand was in front, because it was, let's play that again. Oh. Now, two things. First, the asteroid didn't actually hit the Earth. I mean, if you see this, the asteroid was just going along doing its thing, and the Earth came and ram, rammed into it, right? So, we get angry at the asteroid. It was the Earth's fault. <laughs> okay. This is, um, as the, uh, the manager of the Near Earth Object Observations Program said at the UN, this is the case of a perfectly good asteroid being run over by the Earth. <laughs> and he did say that at the UN. And the second thing is, there's the Sun, there's the Earth, where is daylight? Over there, right? This side is night. So asteroids, I mean, sorry, telescopes on the ground are looking where? They're looking out here. All this sky. And the asteroid came from out there. So telescopes on Earth could not have seen this asteroid. The only time we could have seen it is on a previous pass where maybe the Earth was here and the asteroid was here. So it narrowly missed and it was being illuminated by the sun. But we didn't. And that's why we have to keep on looking, keep on looking, and make sure that we find these before they hit. And then, can you see something there? <laughs> so, challenge number four is that we're looking for a black cat in a coal mine. Because asteroids are not very, very bright. They just reflect light. And they reflect between 3% and 25% of the light hitting on them. So 3% is like newly laid asphalt. It's that black. And 
for some comparison, the moon, which looks really, really bright, actually only reflects 12%. It's just very big. That's why it seems so bright. If it were a lot smaller, if it were 20, 30 meters, it wouldn't be anywhere near as bright. So let's play a game. Let's spot the dinosaur killer. Yeah, can you guys see it? Yeah? <laughs> I have a prize if somebody can point out where it is in this picture. Okay, let me zoom in to the top. Uh, can you see it? Yeah, people can see it now. Yeah, can you see it better? And then for those of you who still can't see it, I'm going to make this a negative. And now it, it pops up a lot better. That is actually to scale. So that little thing wiped out all the dinosaurs. Yep. That little thing. That's why I love this image. So we are looking for asteroids. Sorry? What was the diameter? 10 kilometers, about six miles. Not very big. The Neo Hunters, these are the telescopes that are surveying, looking for, uh, for asteroids, near Earth asteroids, right now. We have uh, some of the, the really old ones, this one up there, that's the Space Guard, which was the, the first telescope to use CCDs to look for near Earth asteroids and to actually find the first near Earth asteroid on a CCD uh, in the late 80s, I believe. We have the Catalina Sky Survey, the two telescopes up here. That's in Arizona. Uh, Space Guard up there is also in Arizona. We have an old one here, Lonios and NEAT. There are acronyms, and I'm not going to tell you what they mean. Um, they're no longer functioning. This is PanSTARS, which is in Hawaii. And right now it's finding the highest number of near-Earth asteroids. This very cool-looking telescope, and if any of you as an amateur astronomer, you'll know that's a cool-looking telescope. And it's that cool-looking because it belongs to DARPA and the United States Air Force. And it's used to look for satellites. But asteroids creep into the images, so they have a little program where they send us the observations of asteroids. This one is a space telescope, and it's WISE, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. And that was up in 2010, and it had... A, little, a group of people whose sole role was to look for near Earth asteroids in the images. They were called NeoWise. And it's just been uh, brought back to life two years ago, I think, uh, with some NASA funding to, to look, keep on looking for near Earth asteroids, even though some of its channels, the infrared channels, don't work because it ran out of coolant. And that group, which is led by Amy Mainzer at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, have proposed to build a better NeoWise, specifically designed to look for near-Earth asteroids. And here's the one thing about all these telescopes. None of these telescopes that are currently finding near-Earth asteroids were built or designed to find near-Earth asteroids. They've all been repurposed to some point. NeoWise wasn't repurposed, it just took the data that nobody wanted, because nobody cared about the asteroids, right? And they, they took that out. Some of the others were actually uh, retrofitted, and there were changes made, new cameras installed, but they were originally built for something else. This one here that's going in through the slit, that is the first telescope that's actually built to look for near-Earth asteroids, and it's Atlas. It's in Hawaii, and it, it's already found one near-Earth asteroid, and it's, I think it's coming online next month um, to observe the sky full-time. And it's going to consist of two telescopes when it's fully done in a, a year from now. And they hope to scan the whole sky every night. Also, they claim. So this is the number of near-Earth asteroids discovered since 1985. As you can see, not much happening. Um, a few brave souls here. Um, Gray Space Watch. Remember that, that old telescope. And... They started to get funding in, in the late 90s to, to look for near-Earth asteroids. This red is linear, which was the precursor to that very cool DARPA telescope. So they were looking for satellites, and they sent us the asteroid data. And then the Catalina Sky Survey kicked in, and as you can see, they were finding the lion's share of asteroids. Then pan stars come online, and what happened between here and here is that here, the telescope was repurposed to look for NEOs full-time. 
So in March of 2014, it went 100% neo hunting, and in 2015, it's been 100% and it's going to continue. And they've just added a second telescope that's even better than the first one. So we can expect that this bar, which is at almost 1600, will probably break 1600 and hopefully 1700. Now it's time for another movie, and if the music doesn't play, it doesn't matter. You are going to see all the asteroid discoveries from 84 to 2014, or at least up to Jupiter. This is Jupiter up out here, and all labels, but that's Jupiter. It's going to disappear. And you can see Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. And when an asteroid is discovered, you get a, it flashes in white, and then it goes to green. And you can see here kind of a, a river, right? That's the, the asteroid belt. And at some point, you're going to start seeing a few red ones show up here. And those are the near-Earth asteroids. So I imagine you guys have spotted Earth, right? Which is that dot there. And if you see where all these white points are, they are opposite the Sun, right? Because we're discovering asteroids from the ground, and we need them to reflect sunlight. And as I mentioned, NEOWISE is an infrared telescope. And what's different about that is that they don't look at reflected light. They look at emitted light, because heat is emitted in the infrared wavelengths. So asteroids are warmer than the background, which is absolute zero. So when you're looking with an infrared telescope, you actually see the heat emitted by the asteroid. And what's important is that that the amount of heat is proportional to the size of the asteroid. And when we look with ground-based telescopes and reflected light, we can't really tell what size the asteroid is. We, have, we can say, well, it's between 10 and 30 meters, it's between 100 and 300 meters, but that's the best we can do. When you're looking with the infrared, you can actually say, well, it's 100 to 130, which is a lot better. Now you can see building up. Did you see a flash of light here? Those were Trojans. These are the asteroids that follow and move in front of Jupiter. So if Jupiter's at 3 o'clock, the Trojans are at 1 o'clock and at 5 o'clock. <coughs> and now you can see a lot more near-Earth asteroids that have been picking up since 2000 when all the surveys came online. And look at that sea of green. And you can see where particular surveys um, pick out the asteroids in the main belt, and let's wait a moment for 2010. Let's see what happens. Yeah, you all saw that? that kind of lighthouse? That was Neowise, because Neowise doesn't look away from the sun. It actually looked at a right angle to the sun. So it's able to find asteroids that you wouldn't be able to find from the ground. And thank you, Scott Manley. Who made this wonderful video. He's a PhD astronomer who was reformed and is now in, in a real job. <laughs> so right now we know of 700,000 asteroids in the solar system. Uh, back then, 2014, I think it was probably 670, something like that. And all these asteroids that are being found lately since the 2000s in the asteroid belt are found by the surveys looking for near-Earth asteroids, because there are so many more asteroid belt, main belt asteroids. So for every one NEO that they find, they probably find 40 or 50 main belt asteroids. So, funny enough, this is like collateral. This isn't even the science that they're going for, but they're finding it. So the, the MPC, let me quickly explain what we do. Um, we start with the surveys. They open up whenever it's not cloudy, and they take thousands of observations each night, which they send to us at the, the MPC. And that, that is me wearing a suit back then. Um, of course, we wear suits to work, right? So we take the data. If it's a known asteroid, we put it in our database, which is that. And if it's if we think it's a near-Earth asteroid, but we're not sure, we put it in what's called the near-Earth object confirmation page. And astronomers all over the world, amateur and professional, go to that page 
and say, okay, well, I can, I can try and follow that object. And they go, they try to find it, they send us the, the observations back again. We see, okay, yep, this matches, we have a better orbit, we still don't know if it's an Earth asteroid, so whoop, up it goes again. And usually after two or three nights of an object being on the NEOCP, sorry, another acronym, uh, we can tell, well, yes, it definitely is a near-Earth asteroid, or it definitely is a main belt asteroid, or whatever. If it is a near-Earth asteroid, we immediately announce it. So if you follow us on Twitter, or Facebook, or Google+, uh, we'll announce near-Earth asteroids, especially if they're flying by. Those are the ones that we announce when they're flying by Earth. And we put the data into our database, and the observations, which are freely available, as are the orbits, the observations are downloaded by the NASA uh, Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, and by NEODICE, which is a group in Italy. And these guys basically redo the calculations that we do to make sure that everything fits. And this is especially important if we discover an impactor, because we want to make sure that we both, well, the three of us, will get the, the correct answer. And this is, this is the core of what the MPC does, and we're funded by a NASA grant uh, to do all this. And the main job is to help coordinate the discovery of near-Earth asteroids. But in order to know if an asteroid is a near-Earth asteroid or not, we actually have to keep a huge database of 700,000 other objects to be able to match against. So there's a, there's a lot of work that goes into a very small part of our job. And this is a map of active observatories since 1947. Active observatories sending near-Earth asteroid observations. And you can see the numbers are really low for most of the years. 1947 was when the MPC was formed at the University of Cincinnati, and it moved here to SAO in 1978. And it's probably going to stay here for the foreseeable future. Now, the number of sites are growing in the 80s. They're going to grow even higher in the 90s. CCDs show up in the 90s, which really helped a lot of amateurs start observing once CCDs are cheaper. Now we're above 200 sites already by the year 2000. And you can see how they're clustering in Europe and the US. There are some in, in South America. And Japan has surprisingly a large amount of them. And we're missing a lot in Russia. Um, don't know why. And unfortunately, Africa is also missing out. Um, but Russia is a big issue because we have coverage along, along all this line, and then it's broken up for a whole bunch of hours. So if, if something is discovered uh, by a European observer, for example, it can be followed up a few hours later by somebody in the United States. But after that, it can't be followed up until it hits Japan. And then it can't be followed up for many more hours until the Europeans uh, can observe it again. And if you had invested in the MPC back in 1990, right? <laughs> If you'd invested a dollar, um, you'd have 20, what is it, 21 million dollars right now. Um, it's not an investment graph, obviously. This is the number of observations from 1975. The red are the total number of observations that we receive, and the blue ones are the ones that we can actually match to an, either a known asteroid or an, a new asteroid that we can confirm is a new asteroid. And it's, you can tell here that it's close because we have a big file of of observations that we don't know what they match. And every time an asteroid gets a new orbit, or every time a new asteroid is discovered, we plow through that file and try to match them up. Uh, so this file is continuously being, it, we add new observations that we can't match, and we take out observations that, oh, this observation from five years ago is actually for this asteroid that's just been discovered. So we expect to break 25 million uh, for 2016. And again, your tax dollars at work. Uh, NASA recently announced the Planetary Defense Coordination Office like a week ago, two weeks ago, and they're going to coordinate the dishing out of funds to, uh, for the surveys, for the MPC, for other astronomers doing science for asteroids, and they're also going to coordinate with other agencies, such as FEMA, for example. So now FEMA as well as running desktop exercises for tornadoes and levees that break and all types of natural disasters, they also now run exercises for near-Earth asteroid impacts. Hopefully that makes you feel safer. So, some more fun. 
asteroid deflection, because if you are going to get hit and we do discover the asteroid, we want to do something about it, right? So one dinosaur is saying to the other, all I'm saying is now is the time to develop the technology to deflect an asteroid. <laughs> now, the dinosaur gets it. <laughs> Did you put that in there, Christine? No? I hate these guys. So that's not how you do it. It's not, no. That's how you do it in Boston. It's a little bit less crazy than Armageddon, okay? This is more serious. This is a gravity tractor. So it sounds like science fiction, but it works. We can do the math. If you put a sufficiently heavy ship next to an asteroid, very close, and you can see that the rockets here are firing at an angle, so they're not firing against the asteroid. You put it close and you, you know, you like that really, really slowly, you actually pull via gravity the asteroid behind you. Now, for this to work, it's very slow, so you need to discover the asteroid many years in advance. <laughs> but it would work. Another option, that's an impactor. So, you know, it's basically like throwing a pea at a boulder. And if you throw it hard enough, the boulder will probably move. So that's what we're hoping to do. You have a very, very heavy uh, craft, or a craft that fires a very heavy piece of metal at the asteroid, and you hope that that nudges the asteroid. Now, we're not trying to like kick the asteroid and get it to go a few miles. You just need to move it maybe a few millimeters, if you move it a few millimeters, many years in advance, that is enough to propagate so that when it's expected to hit us, say, 10 years later, it's not here, it's here. So the Earth was going to be here, the asteroid is here, and it passes safely through. So again, you, we need to discover the asteroid way in advance. This is an idea from the Planetary Society. They're called mirror bees. And the idea is that you have the sun over there, and these parabolic mirrors uh, collect sunlight and reflect it onto the asteroid, concentrate it, and then the asteroid, you, you turn some of it molten, and it gases off, and then that gas is actually what moves the asteroid. Again, it's not going to move very fast, but you need to just move it enough to nudge it out of the way. That's... <laughs> This is actually serious. This is a serious one. Um, so you might start off by writing go away, but the idea is that you paint an asteroid white. Remember that I said that asteroids tend to be very dark. And even the brightest asteroids reflect only a quarter of the light that hits them. If you paint it completely white, it's going to reflect close to 100%. And sunlight can push it. It seems like it wouldn't, but again, over a few years, it's going to push it. And if it can just push it enough to nudge it out of the way, which is what I keep saying, right? Just enough to nudge it out of the way, then we're golden. And if it were a very bright asteroid, maybe you want to go the other way. You want to paint it black so that the sunlight stops pushing it so much, so then it'll get closer to the sun. And then the, I guess we're going back to Armageddon, <laughs> the nuclear option. If the asteroid is discovered too close, to Earth, um, by too close, I mean not far enough into the future, maybe it's going to hit in a year or so, or if it's too big, then you need to nuke it. I like Armageddon, though, because they're wrong. You don't drill and put <laughs> a nuclear explosive inside the asteroid, because then that's going to, best case scenario, you break it up in two, and then instead of one city getting wiped out, you have two cities getting wiped out, right? Or two tsunamis to deal with. You don't want that. So the way this works is that you explode the nuclear device right up next to the, the asteroid. So you get a push from the explosion, and then you melt, similar to how the, the mirror bees were melting, you melt a section of the asteroid, which is going to outgas, and you also get all the debris from the explosion from the asteroid that flies off. So all this is giving the asteroid momentum in the other direction. And maybe you need more than one explosion, but this would give it a major push. And this would be the only option if we don't discover the asteroid early enough. And we can also mine the asteroids. There are actually 
two companies that have been set up. Um, they've been running for three years. They have projects. They they have backers. They have financial plans, and they hope within ten to twenty years to mine the asteroids. And the profit here is not actually on Earth, even though there are some asteroids that are that have a lot of platinum group metals that are very useful. The carbonaceous asteroids, they can be up to 70% water. The water is mixed in with minerals, but it's there. So if you can harvest that water, you can sell it in low Earth orbit because the International Space Station needs water, for example, and it takes many, many thousands of dollars to get a liter of water up there. If it were already up there for sale and you sold it for half the price, would NASA buy? They'd have to, right? <laughs> it's your tax dollars. So you can tell your local government representative that you support asteroid mining. It makes sense. And, and just for fun, this is from uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab. It's an, an idea, right? It, it's not going anywhere yet, but it's there. It's called Comet Hitchhiker. It's not that the comet is called Hitchhiker. It's that this ship is a comet hitchhiker. It has a tether. So the idea is it hitches onto the comet and goes for a ride. And there have been ideas proposed for, for decades, actually, that you could create some kind of travel system around the solar system by hitching rides on different asteroids. So you jump on a near-Earth asteroid that goes out to Mars, then you can jump on another one that goes from Mars into the main belt, then you jump on another one that goes from the main belt out to Jupiter or Saturn, and it's going to take you a very long time, but you could eventually make your way anywhere in the solar system. In that sense, it's a bit like the MBTA, right? <laughs> Hopefully the MBTA will not be administering this transport system. This is being recorded, right? Okay. I'll never get a job at the MBTA. So please visit the MPC website. Um, it's minorplanetcenter.net, easy to remember. Uh, on the right, here you'll find on the front page the tallies for near-Earth asteroids discovered. I think I got this yesterday. So this month we've already found 112, and these are near-Earth objects, actually, which includes some near-Earth comets. So that's the number of near-Earth objects that we have so far. Um, this is the number of total asteroids all over the solar system that we have. And if you scroll further down, which I can have it, you have a flyby list, which shows you the asteroids that are flying by closer than 50 times the distance to the moon. And I encourage you to go visit and be surprised by how many actually pass that close. People think it happens, you know, well, how often do people think something passes by closer than the moon, for example? Like once a month, raise your hand. Once every six months, once a year, well, once every 10 years. Not sure. <laughs> okay. So actually, once a month, more or less, uh, an asteroid we discover, and generally they're discovered as they're flying by, an asteroid is discovered that flies closer than the moon to Earth, once a month. And because this is semi-random, last week we had three. We discovered three asteroids that passed that close. So, to summarize, and... I'm just putting this picture up because it's amazing. This is Comet 67P, and I'm going to try and say it in front of a live audience. <clears throat> Comet Kurumov Gerasimenko. <laughs> I think if there are any Russians, you can correct me. Um, it's five miles across, I believe, more or less. Rosetta spacecraft from ESA is visiting it right now. You probably all heard about the little lander that got lost when it landed. Very sad story. There's a cartoon on, on the YouTube. I, uh, <coughs> I encourage you to watch it and bring a handkerchief because it, it's, it, it really tugs at your heart's ring. Um, but we're still orbiting it. So we, the lander, we've lost contact with it and um, it's, it's gone to sleep forever. But we're still orbiting it. And you see plumes here as it's getting closer to the sun and we'll see even more activity as we go along. But, you know, doesn't it look a lot like Comet Itak I mean, Asteroid Itakawa that I showed before? You got boulders, you got all this regolith, um, the two lobes. So the materials are slightly different, 
but you can clearly tell that they're related objects. So hopefully what you take away from today is that you should be very afraid of asteroids <laughs> because they can ruin your day. Um, they can ruin your whole species, which sucks. But they're, they're also beautiful. I certainly think, I look at this and I think, this is artistically beautiful, pleasing to the eye. I want to see more photographs of this. Um, but it's also scientifically beautiful. We learn so much, not only about asteroids, but about the solar system itself from asteroids. Really far-reaching scientific knowledge. And there's fun stuff that can be done with asteroids. We can make money from them if we mine them. We can maybe zip around the solar system if we catch a ride on them. But more importantly, remember that the 10 million closest neighbors to Earth are the asteroids. And we've barely scratched the surface, and we barely know any of those 10 million neighbors. And they can teach us so much about the solar system and maybe even about life and ourselves. So thank you very much for coming, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. and I already see a gentleman with his hand up over there. Um, what does it take, you said, you know, if it comes to within the orbit of the moon, what's the margin between that and actually, like, like what does it take to get sucked in, essentially, I guess is what I'm saying. Yes, so the, the area of space around Earth where gravity is affecting other objects, it's called the Hill Sphere, and it extends to about four moon distances, about four moon distances. It doesn't mean it's going to get sucked in. It means that if an asteroid passes closer than that, then it's being affected more by the Earth than it is by the Sun. The asteroid isn't orbiting the Earth, right? It's orbiting the Sun. So the Earth will deflect it or will, will change its its direction. And that is that, that happens often, not just with the Earth, well, often in astronomical timescales, but over the course of a few million years, this happens a lot with Venus, Earth, and Mars. And that's how asteroids will change their orbits, get kicked out, or even fall into the sun. Young person right over there. <laughs> you have a question? Is there anything that hits us that is not an asteroid? Anything that hits us that's not an asteroid? Not. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Well, it all depends what you want to call it. So some <laughs> astronomers will call asteroids smaller than a meter a meteoroid. But really it's just, you know, it's 0.9 meters or 1.1 meters. It's still a chunk of rock. So really it's chunks of rock and metal that hit us. And you can call them asteroids or you can call them something else if they're smaller. We also get hit by dust. I guess that's not, that's not an asteroid. We get hit by a, well, the Earth accumulates 100 1,000 tons, 100 tons, I forget that number, I think it's 100,000 tons of mm -hmm. dust every year from space. And it produces beautiful meteor showers, too, so yes. there's an advantage to being hit by space stuff. Yes, sir, in the middle of the row. Yes, yes uh, you, put, you showed the Oort cloud, and I wonder if you just comment very briefly on the ninth planet hypothesis. So three questions. <laughs> <laughs> what about that planet nine? <laughs> I'm wondering how long it was going to take to get there. Um, I have not read the paper. I have not had time. Uh, I have read about it, though, and uh, I do know about the theories. This theory has been going on around for a long time, and there have been other calculations made about this. So it's possible. It's possible that there is a large planet out there that's perturbing these asteroids. It's not in the Oort cloud, though. It's closer. It is in the Kuiper belt. It doesn't, if it exists, it doesn't get very close because people have been searching for it for many years. Um, the one thing this theory does have going for it is that it places the orbit not along the plane of the ecliptic, which is where the planets are going around the sun, but actually at an angle. 
which would explain why it hasn't been found, because the searches for objects in the Kuiper belt all look around the ecliptic plane. So just to make it clear, it hasn't been found. It's been hypothesized that it exists, and uh, an orbit has been given, but this orbit can be quite wrong. And we don't know where in the orbit it is. So this orbit goes around the sun, and it can be in any one of these points, and it's going to be quite dim. So Look at today's news. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at today's news. What? What? I, I, I think I convincingly found it. Really? Uh, I haven't heard that. Oh, really? I've not seen that. No. I was just going to say, it's going to take years to find. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It has been found, but, but, but the data suggesting its existence is much better than data pre for previous uh, such observations. Yes, there, there have been a number of objects discovered recently in the past even three years um, that, that all seem to, the closest point to the sun in their orbit, all seems to be um, very, very snug in the same area. Um, and that's a bit strange because we would expect to, them to have been randomly distributed, and they're not. So, so yes, I'm, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm saying that there is good reason to believe that it does, but it needs to be found. Until somebody observes it, you know, it's just news. And with that, I know that we have some groups here who need to head out, so uh, we're going to wrap it up for the evening. I want to thank you all for joining us, and I encourage everyone who still has questions to come up and ask our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.